Hello. In the last episode, we were in a world of love, sex and kingship with the Anglo-Norman romance poem Roman de Silence. For this episode, we're staying with the romance genre and we have a blockbusting tale of sex and violence, of fighting, feasting and loving. This time, we're looking at a Middle English romance, Havelock the Dane, written at the end of the 13th century. Irina, can you give us a very quick sketch of what actually happens in Havelock? Because it's this kind of wonderful sort of double helix of a story with these, with these two narratives that eventually become joined. That's right. You know, Havelock is sometimes described as a Cinderella story, but it's actually two Cinderella stories. We start in England with King Athelwald, whose reign is good and just. And, you know, that's something we could talk about later, but he's a very idealized king. He's dying and he, his daughter is too young to inherit the throne. So he asks one of his trusted counselors, Godrich, to care for her until she's of age. Godrich takes over, he oppresses Goldeboru, the daughter, and he basically um, grabs the power for himself. Over in Denmark, just about the exact same thing happens with the royal family there. Birkabane has actually three children, Havelock and two sisters, and he asks his trusted advisor, Goddard, which I guess proves that you shouldn't trust men with a name good in the word good in their name. He asks Goddard to take care of the three children until they're of age. And obviously Havelock is supposed to inherit when he's an adult. Goddard instead imprisons the kids, eventually brutally murders the two princesses, and gives Havelock to a local fisherman to, to be killed, essentially, to be drowned in the sea. Grimm is the fisherman. He eventually saves Havelock. They all run away to England and they essentially live a very poor existence in England. Grimm has three sons and two daughters as well and his wife. They're all struggling to catch enough fish and get enough food to keep the family afloat. Havelock winds up leaving the family because he realizes he's he's eating too much uh, for <laughs> for the family economy. He works as a cook's aide and eventually comes to the attention of Godrich, remember that's the English baddie, who decides this is a fantastic way to get rid of Goldeboro. He's going to marry her off to uh, a commoner and she's going to be out of the way. He'd made this solemn promise to her father that she would never marry anyone who was beneath her station, you know, only the most noble husband. Exactly. And so it's this kind of final act of treachery that he he chooses a cook's knave. But yet it is an incredibly hunky cook's knave who turns out to be actually a member of the Danish royal family. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody can magically finds out at the right moments that he's a that he's a king's son and meant to be a future king because Havelock has a sort of golden cross on his shoulder. He has a king's mark on his shoulder, and when he sleeps, a beam of light comes out of his mouth and brights up, you know, lights up whatever room he's in. So. Goldeboru figures this out eventually. She realizes she's actually married the right man. After all, they head back to Denmark where they're hosted by a somehow odd figure, Uba, a, no a Danish nobleman who is seems to have been playing playing political games in Denmark. But the moment Havelock arrives, he he does also recognize Havelock's nobility and that he should get on the right side of things. Long story short, Havelock takes over Denmark, not without a fight, has Goddard executed. Quite quite a quite a graphic fight. I mean, you know, you don't if there was a Hollywood remake, in fact, a Hollywood remake of this romance would not really change any details because it's already got all the sort of Hollywood elements. Yeah. You know, you've got this amazing fight scene and feasting and anyway, sorry, go on. And fish. We'll get to the we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll get to all of this later. And they head back to England and also conquer England. So by the end we have this fabulous Happy ending where essentially Havelock and his queen Goldeboro are joint king and queen of England and Denmark who are under both of their rule. So that's the outline of the story, but in a sense that tells us very little about what a textured story it is, you know, how much detail there is about the, the figures in it, how layered and sometimes complex the characters are, and all of the day-to-day -day details that we find 
in the poem, which I think are really what elevate it above a just the story of political conquest or reconquest. Yeah. So let's let's start perhaps with that moment at the beginning when we have the description of King Athelwald, because it's sort of, in, in some ways, it seems like an odd beginning, but actually it sets the tone and it introduces a whole load of themes that become really, really important later on. Well, I think the first thing we have to say is Athelwald is an Anglo-Saxon name. So already this is being set in a pre-conquest legendary English past. We can't identify this figure with any specific person. I think it's more about the fantasy of a kind of English past with an absolutely ideal king. He is the god kuning or good king of Beowulf, except unlike the kings in Beowulf, he's actually much more lovable. Knights love him, priests love him, wives and maidens also love him. And part of the reason he's so loved is he has you know, in a sense, a little bit of a police state in England. He has extremely tough punishments on outlaws and robbers, but that means that merchants can wander freely throughout the country and, and sell their wares. He guides the fatherless. And this is what I find very interesting. He protects women from shame and rape, even from knights. And the narrator is very specific in saying, you know, unless it is their will... <laughs> You can imagine women sometimes consenting to to shame. That's okay. But there's a sense that he, he meets out absolutely brutal punishment to rapists, which is fascinating as a vision of what a just society is. It's a society where women have control over their own bodies. So that's one interesting thing. And the other interesting thing also, you know, thinking about Athelwald and, and women, as he's dying... He laments the fact that his daughter is still an infant. She can't walk. She can't speak, he says. And he imagines, you know, that if she were old enough, she could ride a horse and lead an army and become essentially queen of England in her own right. And of course, this is a time in England when there has never been a queen ruling in her own name. So it's it's fascinating sort of late 13th century imagination of a woman ruler, a just woman ruler who would who would lead an army. Why not? So this is this is where things begin and I think that sets the tone for much of the rest of the poem that a lot of the rest of the poem is going to be concerned with justice, with good rulership and I think also with the role of women in a just society. And also we should just say that you know, from the beginning, we have this sense that this is a poem that is meant to be delivered orally. You know, have the, have these wonderful kind of interjections from the narrator. You know, throughout the story, there are sort of moments when the narrator will say, well, well, we'll leave this strand of the story and we'll, we'll move on to another one now. And you, you've got this sense of, you know, this is a, is a kind of after dinner story. There's a kind of richness to the sort of orality of this text. That said, there are several moments in the text where books appear and books are clearly very important. I mean, there are, there are several moments in which people swear oaths on books. And so the book symbolizes authority. And so that you have this kind of wonderful tension between this sort of oral performance and then the kind of, you know, the bookish text. Well, Mary, I think what you're introducing is, is something that's going to be a theme today, which is that Havelock is a poem that wants to have it all. You can have anything you want from Havelock. Do you want a hero? You get it. You, got a, you want a, a strong female lead? We have that as well. Do you want grand nobility? We have that. Do you want really plucky peasants? <laughs> yes, we have those too. So really, I think that's, in a sense, why we have this double story. Havelock will just do absolutely everything. And at the very end of the poem, as you mentioned, there's this, there's a feast where, you know, people listen to tales, but they also read tales out of books. So there's a sense, you know, you can have literate people, you can have oral storytellers, everything is there for, for you. Whatever you will want, you will find it in Havelock the Dane. Yeah, and there's a there's an implied audience in there, isn't there? That you know, this is a poem that would satisfy a kind of noble aristocratic audience, but it's also one that would kind of please the masses, right? Because it's it's not only a story about you know the the deeds of the high nobility; it's also about, as you say, the plucky peasants and you know the good the good fishermen and you know the the kindly cook who works in the castle. Thanks for listening to this extract from Medieval Beginnings, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episodes and all our other close reading series, 
sign up to our Close Readings subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.